And now, the conclusion of our thousand dollar movie. Julian Fellows. Titanic. Ah! We're safe now. Nigel. We made it away from that cursed ship. Now I can relax and take off this stifling bikini. Mm. Look out! Behind you! We'll return for the remainder of the conclusion after these messages. The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, I present to you the first part of a new series, a rant about Titanic dramas and history, where I will be exploring some of the worst dramas and films about the sinking of the RMS Titanic. These will be structured in the same way as my Tudor rant series, with sections on the behind-the-scenes cock-ups to give you some context, the characters and story versus the history, authenticity versus the history, how it stands as a drama, and finally a conclusion. Our first port of call in this voyage will be the 2012 Titanic miniseries. Released to coincide with the centenary of the sinking, it was touted as the event of the year, and ITV were hoping this series would be, in effect, a mini Downton Abbey. However, much like its namesake, the series made in voyage did not go exactly as planned, and it was generally panned by critics and audiences alike. Back in 2012, I myself was watching it, and naively clung onto the hope that it could not sink right up until the end, ignoring advice from my mother that it was going down. Several years later, and having had time to reflect on my survival of this particular tragedy, and with it being the anniversary, let us then dive back into Titanic, and just see what exactly went wrong. The RMS Titanic has had numerous films and dramas made about it, and ever since James Cameron's 1997 blockbuster, all Titanic-related dramas have been compared to it as a benchmark, which often lead to some questionable decisions when trying to make a drama, and prove you're not just rehashing the film. The beginnings of this particular drama series go all the way back to about 2007. Ironically enough, the 100th anniversary of J. Bruce Ismay's proposal to build the Olympic-class liners. When some people at ITV were wondering about making a drama for the centenary of the Titanic sinking in 2012. The problem was, though, that given the competition of Titanic related dramas in the past, who would they get to helm the project in order to make it stand out from the rest? By 2010, ITV had released Downtown Abbey, <clears throat> sorry, Downton Abbey, written by Julian Fellows. Downton needs little introduction. It has been wildly successful and, ironically enough, actually starts off with a plot about one of the characters dying on the Titanic. It has been one of ITV's most successful series to date, and so it only seemed logical to have Julian Fellows write for this Titanic drama series as well, owing to the similar time periods. Nigel Stafford Clark, known for his antique collection of BAFTAs, had already been brought in as a producer, along with a host of others, and John Jones would direct. The series would feature an ensemble cast of actors and actresses, most of whom are fairly familiar faces on British TV, such as Jenna Louise Coleman, Stephen Waddington, Toby Jones, and Maria Doyle Kennedy, just to name but a few. Initially, much like the 2003 Henry VIII miniseries, ITV could not find the money for the drama on its own, and so funds were secured from various other companies. In total, the budget came to about £11 million. In May of 2011, the series started filming in Budapest. The set consisted of a large boat deck, various other small sets for the staterooms, cabins, and the centerpiece of the whole set being a £100,000 water tank that could hold 940 cubic metres of water, making it the largest indoor water tank in Europe at the time, apparently. The series aired over the course of a month, with the final episode airing on the 15th of April 2012, the anniversary of the Titanic sinking. As mentioned, the series did not do too well. Critics in the press generally, save for one or two praises here and there, savaged the series, with many dubbing it to be Downton on Sea. Ratings dropped from 7.4 million viewers for Part 1 to 3.5 million for Part 3, albeit with a bit of an increase for the final episode. Apparently, though, a documentary about the comedian Des O'Connor that aired just before the third episode got more views. This particularly annoyed the people involved with the ITV drama series Wild at Heart, which was cancelled around about this time due to budget cuts, in spite of their drama having more views. Nigel Stafford Clark, the producer of this Titanic, decided to honourably go down with his command, and accepted a lot of the blame for the tragedy, in particular the episode structure. 
Meanwhile, Julian Fellows did the opposite, as I will talk about later. The failure of the series was so serious that one article in The Guardian even questioned whether this particular drama could actually sink period dramas altogether. Well, whilst I would not go that far, it is undeniable that this series had some major problems, which we will now look at in detail. Of course, the story of the Titanic needs little introduction, so I will proceed assuming that you, the audience, are aware of at least the basic details regarding the voyage and sinking of the Great Liner. This version of its story does some... weird things in order to make it stand out. The most prominent of these is that each of the first three episodes starts a week or two before the maiden voyage, shows some of the main characters boarding the ship, details the events on board, shows the collision with the iceberg, the evacuation, and ends roughly as the Titanic is beginning its final plunge. And then it starts all over again in the next episode! I must admit, Groundhog Day is the last thing I would expect to see in a Titanic series. Now, when I go through the characters shortly, I will be segregating them by class and reviewing each in turn. Remember though that even though it is meant to be one episode focused on each class, they cross over and mingle so much that it becomes a mess, often leading to the same scene being repeated three and even four times over, including the final episode that just looks at the sinking. The most egregious scene in my mind is the one where the first class family arrive on deck to see life at number one leave with 12, no wait sorry scratch that, 11 people sorry, looks like they couldn't afford one more extra to fit in the boat to make it accurate, and are unable to get it to return. This scene plays out from different angles literally four times, once per episode. It doesn't achieve anything except waste time, which we will look at in the last section in more detail. Now, where on earth to begin with the characters in this? Since Julian Fellows was a writer for this series, it was inevitable that comparisons to Downton Abbey were made. Hell, even the cast themselves took to calling this drama Downton on Sea during filming, well before the press even did. That's why I was calling it in the best as well. <laughs> I'd like that on a t-shirt, on a kind of Blackpool hat. What I, and many others expected though, was at least some originality in terms of writing, and perhaps a look at some stories of actual people on this large passenger liner that are often not talked about. Instead, we unironically got Downton on Sea. The first group of people we meet in this episode 1 of Groundhog Day, Titanic Edition, is the Manton family. Or, or Grex family, I think, since that is their surname, but oh, never mind. The family is made of the Earl of Manton, his wife Lady Louisa, and their rebellious teenage slash 30-something suffragette daughter, Lady Georgiana. For the sake of simplicity, we shall refer to Georgiana as Discount Rose from now on. Discount Rose has a spontaneous relationship with the historical Harry Widener, who died in the actual tragedy. So of course that means we get little of his actual story with his family, and instead he and Discount Rose bond over how much they dislike the old world and its formalities. Although his love of books is not mentioned much as far as I'm aware, even though a library was found in his honour after the tragedy. Well, at least he got some screen time since Discount Rose and Co. nearly missed going on the Titanic in the first place. Of course we'll be glad to arrange a cabin for Lady Georgia. But I'm afraid it won't be near yours. It's a pity I had no, no time or I might have been able to move things around. There, there'll be cancellations, surely. But, uh, there's a waiting list, sir. And several passengers in first wanted a larger cabin if one came free. Slight problem, though, was that, historically, it was barely half full. Julian, the Titanic has to be one of the best research ships to have ever sailed. Isn't that the sort of detail you should check beforehand? I'm sure this made-up first-class family will have an interesting story, like... Um, some confusing plot about Lord Muck having an illegitimate daughter that is mentioned in about two lines. Discount Rose spontaneously falling in love with Widener over their mutual modern views, as previously mentioned. And Lady Muck having a bitch fight with this character. More on her later. Now, you're probably wondering, Cavalier, was there something like 2,200 people on this giant ocean liner? Were there no interesting stories to directly adapt, or at least base the fictional character stories off of, like the 1958 film A Night to Remember did? Ah, well, you see, dear viewer, it was necessary to make it up, since, in reality, there were no interesting stories on the Titanic. This production decided to, instead, make a generic Edwardian drama looking at things going on at the time, like the Suffragette Movement, the Irish Home Rule Act, and so on, with the Titanic being a background thing until the last act of each episode. This, of course, makes perfect sense. Take the suffragette thing. 
As we all know, there were no women on board who were supportive of the suffragette movement and had their own... Oh, no, wait, sorry. There was Elsie Bowerman, a 22-year-old woman, who was a very active member of the Women's Social and Political Union, being one of ten women who accompanied Sylvia Pankhurst to deliver a deputation to Parliament in 1910. After World War I, she wanted to become a lawyer and died in 1972. Shame we didn't get that interesting story. Episode 2 of this... thing mainly looks at the generic second-class couple, the Irish Batley family, made up of John and his wife Muriel. Now, since it is a small world after all, they are intimately tied with the story of the Manton, since John here is his lawyer. I think their characters were a little bit better fleshed out than Lord Muck and his family, though, but that probably would be due to Toby Jones and Maria Doyle Kennedy trying their damned best with this horrible script, with such great moments like Mrs. Batley having hissy fit right in the middle of the sinking to have a go at Mrs. Muck over... Um, Lady Muck hating the Irish and being a general's snob? Now, second-class passengers on the Titanic get forgotten about in the popular narrative, since they were not as glamorous as first-class, nor as impoverished and tragic as third-class. But in spite of that, there are interesting stories to be told. A shame, then, that this second-class family don't even really feel like one. Hell, they spend most of their time in first-class, even having tea with Lord Muck. I tell you what... Why not come for tea with us on Sunday afternoon? I don't think that's allowed, my dear. Okay, I hate to spoil your fun there, my lord, but this is 1912. Classes were segregated and would not be allowed to mingle, and would certainly not be allowed to go and have tea with one another. The only accounts of class mingling I've seen before the disaster was of a husband in first class and his wife in second, who spoke to each other at a railing, as reported by Lawrence Beasley. However, I'm not aware of the identity of this couple, and who knows if they actually were husband and wife, or if Beasley mistook their relationship. I'll expand upon the class mingling in the next section, but having them not adhering to the rules of the period really does not help to convey the idea that we are on the Titanic. I find this all the more baffling since Julian Fellows is meant to be an expert on class-based drama set in this time period. Well, to be fair, we all know there was not a single interesting second-class passage that they could have used, Oh, oh, no, wait, sorry, there was Lawrence Beasley, a science teacher who'd survived by jumping into lifeboat number 13, which was soon afterwards nearly crushed by lifeboat number 15, but fortunately was saved by Stoker Fred Barrett. Beasley went on to write one of the first proper books about the disaster, a mere weeks afterwards, and lived long enough to be an advisor on the night to remember, where he gatecrashed one of the sinking scenes they were filming since he wanted to go down with the ship this time. Shame we didn't get that interesting story. And now, onto the generic third-class family, the Maloneys. Now, there were several hundred people in third class who had interesting stories, so it would have been nice to have seen some real people here. But instead, we get this family who... Um, sorry, just a second, let me just uh, check out the list here. Right, there we go. So our Irish family is Catholic. Check. Oppressed by the British. Check. Dirt poor and have to steal another cabin. Three times over in Groundhog Day. Check. Want to start a new life in America. Check. Jim Maloney, the father, drinks a bit. Check. The father also fights with people. Check. The kids are all ginger. Check. You know, I don't believe this family is stereotypically Irish enough yet. I mean, what I think they're really lacking is a leprechaun as a son who shits rainbows out of his backside. I think they should also have been haunted by the ghost of Oliver Cromwell at some point, with him going around destroying their potatoes and bottles of Guinness, whilst the father goes, Ooh, big aura, every ten seconds. What I'm saying is, Julian, that you really did not lay on the Irish stereotypes enough in this one. So far, though, things are not too crazy. And to be fair, there were probably some families that had some backstories like that. That is until this character turns up called Peter the Painter, who was historically, well, possibly historically, involved in the Siege of Sydney Street the previous year, which is f featured in this Titanic drama. And in this universe, he bores the liner at Southampton. Now, there was an old myth that emerged years later that he was on the Titanic, but it's nothing more than that, a myth right up there with mummy curses and switch theories. Now Peter the Painter, or Bob Ross as I shall call him from now on, somehow magically falls in love with Mary Maloney. I mean, they literally had about three scenes together, and she is just suddenly attracted to him. What the hell is going on here? It feels like we missed a few scenes. I mean, did they know each other beforehand? Did they have some scenes on the ship that we did not see? I don't know. They just love each other now. Julian, I should probably explain this thing to you called character development. If you don't have enough of it, then you don't have a damned character. 
I must marvel at the fact that, back in 1958, A Night to Remember managed to introduce a whole host of characters, both historical and semi-historical, and over the course of two hours, somehow gave them more character development, like the second-class couple sticking together, the third-class Irish pastor saving the Scandinavian girl he had recently met, and so on. Whilst this miniseries, which has nearly double the runtime, struggles to fit any in. And now, as we go down the stereotype list, we come to the plucky Italian waiter Paolo and his stoker brother... Mario. <laughs> oh dear, you missed a trick there, Julian. If only the waiter was called Luigi, then we could have had some hilarious hijinks. Paolo, also known as Discount Fabrizio to others, somehow replaces another waiter that he and his brother got drunk the night before, and Lightholder, admittedly after some persuasion, says, Yeah, sure, take his place. We just let any old body come on as a waiter on the Titanic. I mean, it's not like we should vet you before going to serve the captain and first class passengers. Once aboard, he falls in love with generic maid number 24, otherwise known as Annie Desmond, played by the Doctor's old sidekick. Yet again, we see the spontaneous romance bugs born faster than Corona-chan, and I can effectively sum up their entire storyline as follows. Hey, I know we only met her like three days ago, but do you want to marry me? Oh, blimey, Governor! Knock me sideways, the old dog and bone! That's a bit quick! I know that, but we are on the Titanic. We had better make a use of the time we have. All right, then I guess we can go up those Ethel and Piers and have a walk in the old dick. Oh, that is a wonderful news. My brother Mario will be so pleased. He take us to Mushroom Kingdom to celebrate, eh? Now, of course, as we all know, there were no interesting stories of the crew of the Titanic, and so Julian's hands were tied. Oh no, wait, sorry, there were people like Frank Prentice, an assistant storekeeper, who was awoken by the collision, helped load the lifeboats, then stayed behind and chatted with his friends on the poop deck until the end, when he jumped off the Titanic stern. He then found his friend Cyril Ricks floating in the water, stayed with him until he died, and then swam to a lifeboat, surviving the whole ordeal, and gave many interviews afterwards, before his death in 1982, making him the second to last surviving crew member of the Titanic. Shame we didn't get that interesting story. Now, after meeting all those amazing characters and their riveting stories, I bet you're all anxious to see what happens to them. Well, to sum up, Mary Maloney and her family get in a lifeboat, but daughter number one, otherwise known as Teresa, hears something about the boat being overloaded, so jumps out and runs off to her right. Her father and Bob Ross try to catch up to her by running in the other direction. Bob saves the locked-up Italians, more on that travesty in a moment, and presumably dies. Teresa finds herself trapped by a Bostwick gate, and her dad says, well, guess we'll die then. Now I know some people did give up on survival towards the end, but you would have thought he could try moving forward or something. At least give it a go. Only moments earlier you were frantically looking for your daughter. Ah well, her fate is understandable. A lot of third-class people did die that night, including children, like the entire Goodwin family, who were moving to America since Frederick Goodwin, the father of the family, had got a job in a power plant in Niagara Falls that his brother had secured. They were originally meant to be on another ship, but it was cancelled due to a coal strike, so they were transferred to the Titanic. During the voyage, Harold Goodwin made friends with seven other boys of his age, and went exploring the ship with them, of which only two of his group would survive, and sadly, Harold was not among them. His body, along with most of the rest of his family, was not recovered. Only his younger brother Sidney's body was found floating by the crew of the Mackie Bennett, who at the time were unable to identify him. So they paid for a plaque for him and acted as pallbearers at his funeral, with his tombstone being erected, stating that his body is that of an unknown child. Through DNA testing, he was identified in 2007, but it has been decided to keep the unknown child description so that it can act as a memorial for all of the children lost in the tragedy. Shame we didn't get that interesting story! Well, I am sure we will see the aftermath of this tragic family, with the grief-stricken mother who now has to deal with the loss, or she sails off in the boat and is never seen again. <sighs> anyway, how about the rest of them? Well, by sheer luck, four of the main characters are picked up from the water. Considering that only about half a dozen people were rescued that way, it is a miracle. Not only that, but Batley and Lord Muck survive, when they probably would have had the lower survival chance, particularly Batley, although he does use his dead Muriel as a flotation device, so there is that. Sadly, Discount Fabrizio doesn't make it, and Maid Number 24 gives us a eulogy, and 84 years later presumably joins an expedition to the wreck to find the nudes he drew of her before the sinking. The drama ends there and then, with the Carpathia on the horizon. What the hell was that? Now I know subverting expectations can be an interesting thing to do, and there were people who had miraculous escapes from the Titanic, which could have been interesting to show a bit more of, but it feels to me like you made the characters who should have died live, and vice versa. 
In fact, I know this is true since the writers themselves said that they had no idea who was going to die until the very end. Great forward planning there, guys. Not that I care, really, since I have about as much emotional attachment to these characters as the Titanic's bow does to its stern section. And now, onto the part that will really make my blood boil, the portrayal of the historical characters. Whilst I could not care less about the Downton Abbey rejects we've been dealing with up till now, we are now looking at people who actually existed, and shaped these events. First up, the bridge officers. Captain Smith, played by David Calder, comes across as a bit of a weak-willed pushover, if I'm being honest. To be fair, the real-life Captain Smith, despite his old sea dog looks, had a very soft-spoken voice and was quite a gentle character, if accounts from the people who knew him are to be believed. This captain, though, doesn't seem too concerned with the ship, and spends most of his time dealing with the menial everyday lives of people like the Batleys, even inquiring about his tea with the Mansons. I guess in this universe we now have a reason as to why the Titanic sank. He does have some sympathetic moments, though, like his final conversation with Murdoch not long before the ship finally goes under that, if rewritten a bit, could have been pretty good, but sadly we are given very little to work with. My biggest criticism would be that we barely get anything on the decisions and circumstances that led to the disaster, save for some rushed lines of exposition. Jack Phillips and Harold Bryant, the wireless operators, are not even mentioned. The Californian is literally only seen as an easter egg on the horizon, and we only get a few bits of dialogue with Murdoch and Ismay about the ship's speed and so on. One of the great appeals of the Titanic story is looking at what caused it, the people involved, the decisions made and so on, and trying to understand how this tragedy occurred. I know Fellow stated that he set out to do a drama more focused on the time period than the ship itself, but if that were the case, why even bother having the officers and other passengers then? You might as well have made another Downton Abbey. As for First Officer Murdoch, I will say that that was one of the few portrayals I did not mind. He does have a Scottish accent, and is portrayed a bit more sympathetically in this one, which is a nice touch. We do get a bit of a hint of tension between Wilde and Murdoch, which is understandable given the officer reshuffle, and Lightoller, who was something of a friend of Murdoch in some of his accounts, seems to have been a little lukewarm to Wilde. Some of Murdoch's dialogue is a bit off though, which we will see shortly. Second Officer Lightoller's portrayal though is very off. He spends half his time wandering around the ship, dancing with passengers and randomly getting caught up in their stories. Historically, Lightoller would either be on duty on the bridge, looking for things like icebergs and so forth, and when he was off duty, he would spend most of his time in his cabin, or in and around the officer's quarters. He would sometimes check up on other parts of the ship, but during that time he would be busy doing his duty, not acting as a counsellor to the passengers every trivial needs. This gets even worse during the sinking where he's whizzing around the ship, whereas historically he spent most of his time on the boat deck, launching things called lifeboats. A novel concept, I know. Unless Sir Mariners on the next dive to the wreck find Lightholler's Star Trek teleporter, then I don't think he would be in 12 different places at once. I do also have to complain about the portrayal of 6th Officer Moody. Historically, Moody was the most junior officer, and at barely 24, was also the youngest. This was his first and, sadly, last time working for the White Star Line. He was the officer who answered the call from the lookouts who spotted the iceberg, and, during the sinking, he was very active in the loading and launching of boats. It is believed that, unlike some other boats, the ones he helped with went away fairly full, and he should take credit for saving a number of lives that night. As the most junior, he should also have been the first away, but he decided to stay behind. As mentioned, I've done a video about the Titanic officer's suicide if you want more details, but it seems that the last mention of Moody was atop of the roof of the officer's quarters, where he was trying to help in getting the last of the collapsible boats away, and that is the last mention of him. Some accounts do suggest an officer, possibly Moody, might have reached the upturned collapsible boat B, but sadly dying as soon as he got there. Either way, he was lost that night and his body was never recovered. All that remains now to commemorate his actions are two memorial plaques in and around his hometown of Scarborough. If I had to praise a single officer the most that night, then I think it would be Moody. How is he portrayed in this one, though? Well, other than seeing him briefly answering the call to the lookouts, he spends most of his time on this version of the Titanic, locking the doors to keep the third-class passengers downstairs, whilst also forcing a load of Italian waiters into a room in order for them to drown. If you'll excuse me for a moment, I'm just going to go and compose myself. <laughs> Forgive the outburst, but I hope you can see why I would be angry at this point. Moody was arguably one of the most honourable officers on the Titanic, and gave his life saving others. To portray him effectively trying to murder innocent people is absolutely outrageous. 
It's funny that James Cameron got a lot of flack for his portrayal of Murdoch, but this this is a hundred times worse. Mr. Fellows, you are lucky it's been over a hundred years and that Moody has no relatives alive at the time. Otherwise, there might be people trying to take you to court for defamation of his character. Of course, it would not be a Titanic drama without the ship's designer, Thomas Andrews. Sadly, we don't get too much of him, and he is basically, like Murdoch, relegated to being the foreshadowing figure, engaging in clunkily written conversations about the lack of lifeboats and so forth. Seeing as though the Titanic sister ship, Olympic, had been in service for over a year, it would seem odd that he would suddenly bring up the lifeboat issue. Hell, did the designers of the Lusitania or any of the other big liners have this conversation beforehand as well? No, I highly doubt it. Andrews may have brought it up during the initial planning stages, and the Davits were designed to take extra boats in case the regulations were changed, but by this stage, Andrews was more worried about the more menial elements of the ship, like enclosing the forward part of the promenade deck, numbers of coat hooks and so on, unless he did this every time he went on the main voyage of a big passenger liner. Andrews certainly did take great care of the people working in the Highland Wolf shipyard, so it was good to see this side of him in this drama a little bit, although I don't think he would go as far as to actually buy tickets from the Maloney family. However, there is a slight problem with his generous act. Now, it was very kind of you to book tickets for them, but couldn't you have let them board in Queenstown? You know, that town in Ireland, where the Titanic stopped to pick up Irish passengers, instead of making them go all the way from Belfast to Southampton, which is far more expensive? Hell, could you not have booked them a bigger cabin as well so they didn't have to go and steal someone else's? Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line, had the misfortune to survive the disaster, and has been seen as a villain ever since. I will say, credit where credit is due, they don't go and claim he was trying to break any speed records, and do have an exchange where he talks about how the White Star Line is more about comfort than speed, which is pretty accurate. Um, well, kind of. Sort of. Of course, him being involved in the locking Italians in the broom cupboard scene is highly inaccurate, but I have already ranted about that a little bit. His escape from the Titanic, though, was rather controversial, and accounts of it are a bit contradictory, which is not helped by the fact that, after the inquiries were finished, he became a recluse and never gave any further accounts of that night, taking anything else he may have known with him to his grave. The only time he came close to speaking in his own words was an alleged conversation he had with his sister-in-law some years later. What we do know is that he left in collapsible boat C on the starboard side, that Murdoch was the officer in charge of lowering it, that there was a large crowd of people trying to get into this boat, and that Murdoch had to fire his pistol in the air to keep order. It counts diff though as to how Ismay exactly escaped. Some say he was ordered into the boat by an officer, which is what he said in the alleged interview with his sister-in-law. Others, that he simply got in it as it was lowering, since there was room in the boat, which is the story he went with at the inquiries. This version sticks with the traditional Ismay gets into the boat as it is lowering narrative, which I can forgive. However, this was at a point in the disaster when it was nearing the end, and we do know for a fact that there were people pushing and shoving the way to try and get into the last boats, and were only stopped by the aforementioned gunshots. That could have been a nice bit of drama there to show, but sadly it was missed, and an examination of one of the most controversial scenes of that night was left by the wayside. Finally, we do get a few passengers in there who weren't spawned from the mind of Julian Fellows. First up, we get a brief look at John Jacob Astor, one of the richest men on the Titanic. Now, Astor came from a very wealthy family, but caused a bit of a scandal when, at the age of 47, he divorced his wife and married 18-year-old Madeleine Talmadge Force. They decided to go to Europe for a bit to let the heat of the scandal die down, returning to Europe on the Titanic, Madeleine now being pregnant. I will say that this is one of the few historical stories that was presented okay for the most part. However, they do propagate the old myth that Astor was hit by one of the ship's funnels, which is not true. His body was found in the pristine condition. Well, as pristine as can be expected for a corpse rotting in the Atlantic for nearly a week, but it was certainly not crushed and blackened by soot, as some accounts claimed. However, the Duff Gordons in this come off nearly as badly as Ismay and Moody. Historically, Sir Cosmo and Lady Duff Gordon boarded lifeboat number one, along with their secretary and a handful of other passengers at the urging of First Officer Murdoch. Now this boat was launched just after 1am, at a time when many people were refusing to get into the boat, so the Duff Gordon's party were the only passengers willing to board. Murdoch, interpreting his orders as women and children first, rather than women and children only, allowed nine members of the crew, predominantly stokers, into the boat as well. With no one else willing to come forward, and with several other boats left to launch, Murdoch gave the order and they lowered away. The boat with capacity for 40, leaving with barely 12. What happened following that, though, would become infamous and effectively ruin the Duff Gordons. Sometime after the ship had sunk, one of the crew mentioned that they had lost everything they had on the Titanic, 
and Sir Cosmo said to them that he would make sure they were paid a fiver each to replace their lost kit, a fiver being equivalent to nearly £400 today in purchasing power. Unfortunately for Sir Cosmo, this was interpreted by the press as him trying to bribe the crew not to go back to pick up survivors in the water, forever painting him as a villain. Now, we will never know the full story, and the Duff Gordons may well have been trying to cover up their actions, but at the very least, they cannot be blamed for getting into a boat at the urging of an officer, at a time when most people were refusing to enter one. Now, how does this wonderful series portray the Duff Gordons? Well, that money to pay for their kit is an actual bribe in this version. It's not right if we don't try. I don't think we should. We must go back. I don't agree. It could be very dangerous. If we get home, I'll give every one of you a fiver. Seriously, you had a golden opportunity to look at the story of a controversial figure and perhaps present a more nuanced version of events, but instead, you basically just reproduce slander worse than what the contemporary press produced. I'm seeing a pattern here with these historical characters. Instead of trying to look at the actual characters and what they did, analysing the varying perspectives of their actions and so forth, this production either went with the worst interpretation of their lives, or simply used them as a blank slate to project whatever character was needed for this hacked up plot, like what happened with Moody. I will say that there were one or two little bits in there that at least referenced actual events that happened that night, like the Countess of Rothers, albeit in the wrong boat, Jack Thayer and Milton Long jumping off the ship, and the First Class Allison family being featured. However, they are basically cameos, and we get next to nothing about them as characters, which is a shame, since their stories are far more compelling than the made-up ones we got. The Allison family, for example, were a Canadian family that, on the night of the disaster, met with tragedy when Hudson Allison, the father, did not believe Alice Cleaver, the nurse to the children, that the ship was sinking. Cleaver, therefore, decided to grab baby Trevor and get into a boat. While some mentioned Bessie Allison, the mother, getting into a boat with her young daughter Lorraine, she eventually got out when she heard that her son might still be on the ship. Unfortunately, she and her husband realised too late that Trevor was already away safely, and the rest of the family perished, Lorraine having the misfortune to be the only child in first class to die that night. We do at least get some bits with their story, but it is basically a series of cameos. They really should have been main characters. We could then have explored this interesting story, and many more besides, but instead we were left with Discount Rose, Generic Maid number 24, and Bob Ross. Moving away from the characters, the storyline we get regarding actual events is rather jarring, not helped by the aforementioned ReZero approach Julian Fellows took. One of the most pivotal scenes in any Titanic drama is the collision scene. For me, the best version has to be the one we see in A Night to Remember. There is no dramatic music, orders are given quickly and efficiently, and the silence as this giant iceberg will dooms ever closer sends chills down your spine. I'm not a fan of the scene in the 1997 version, since it involves a lot of over-the-top music and shouting and screaming, which ruins it for me, but at least Cameron stuck to the events pretty well. The dialogue in that version is broadly accurate, right down to the lookouts thinking they'd actually missed the iceberg, and Captain Smith and Murdoch's exchange after the iceberg hits. Let us have a quick look at this Titanic's version of it, which, due to copyright, I will have to break up a bit. What did you see? Iceberg right ahead! Hand the starboard! Hand the starboard, sir! How is all the starboard, sir? Turn. Oh, yeah. It is done well done. Find Captain Smith and tell him what's happened. What did I say? Bloody, bloody stupid. I don't know about you, but that felt like a jarring, clanky mess. We don't see the lookout at all in this, so we don't get the initial reaction to it being sighted. The camera moves around like it is in Cloverfield, and then we get this bit of dialogue from Murdoch. What did I say? Bloody, bloody stupid. This is inaccurate. Whilst there will always be debate about the exact sequence of events, we know for a fact that, not long after she struck the iceberg, Captain Smith rushed out of his cabin, and a conversation like this happened. What have we struck? An iceberg, sir. I hard a starboard and tried to port around her, but she was too close. Close the watertight doors. They are already closed, sir. 
Now the problem in this adaptation though is that Captain Smith has gone off wandering around the deck, chatting to random passengers instead of being in his cabin, that being not only inaccurate, but a dereliction of duty as previously discussed. Not only that, but those lines from Murdoch sound like something in a sitcom. You could genuinely stick a laugh track over it. What did I say? <laughs> what did... What did stupid... Compared to other dramas and films over the years, where we've had a good build-up with the various ice warnings, conversations between the various officers and higher-ups and so on, we get so little of this beforehand that the collision scene feels almost like it was just tagged on since they had no choice but to show it. It would have been so easy to improve just by adding this, for example. Anime Go. Right ahead. So, overall, we got a cocked up version of Downton on Sea, with stereotypes that don't even really fit this time period, and historical characters that have had their stories watered down, and in some cases outright butchered, in order to desperately keep the plot afloat. I know I've come across as very angry and nitpicking in this section, but since this is a story that involved real people in an event that's become very well known, you will forgive me if I get a little bit upset at seeing people being forgotten like that, and outright slandered, in order to make way for Downton Abbey rejects. I find it all the more ironic that Julian Fellows himself said the following. Because these are people who died, I don't think you can just say, well, we'll make this guy a villain. He'll do. I mean, you can invent a baddie if you want one, but I don't really do baddies. My baddies always have some sort of redeeming feature, just as my goodies always do something stupid. Still, these are not my only problems with this miniseries. I will say that at least the authenticity in pretty much all Titanic dramas is leaps and bounds above all the Tudor stuff I've had to endure, but since this event happened a bit over a century ago, I suppose it is understandable that it is easier to get things right. That said though, this miniseries did have a bit of a problem with its authenticity. Many of you will probably find this section rather irritating and nitpicky yet again. Yes, it may come off as that and you will never get everything perfect, but there are some things in this that are wrong for stupid reasons, as you shall soon see, and all of it adds up to paint a rather bad picture of what it was like on the Titanic. Now it is rather funny when you read interviews with Julian Fellows, since he doesn't stop going on about how great his drama is and how it will set the record straight. As we have seen, that did not really work with the characters and sadly the authenticity was definitely off in this a bit, although some areas were not too bad. In terms of outfits, for example, I think they were generally okay. I'm no expert on the fashion of the era, but the ladies and gentlemen wear hats a lot, which is accurate, and the styles look okay. Uniforms of the crew, however, are a bit easy to deal with, and again, they are not too bad, with a few exceptions here and there. What I will point out is the officer's insignia. Lightoller is wearing the insignia of a second officer, which looks like this. Now you were probably saying, but Cavalier, he was the second officer, so that was correct, surely? Well, the problem is, though, is that he was originally the first officer, until just before the ship set sail, at which point he was bumped down to second officer to make room for Wilde as the new chief officer, with former chief officer Murdoch taking up Lytle's old first officer spot, and the old second officer Blair, uh, no, not that one, that's the one, leaving the ship. Because of this sudden change, Lytle did not have time to get its uniform changed, which we can see in this albeit edited photograph taken in Queenstown, and it is believed that Murdoch was in the same predicament. Now, you could excuse them for this mistake, but they explicitly have the officer reshuffle as a plot point, and Lytoller is wearing a first officer's uniform in the scene. Except in the scene before it, when he bores the ship, where he has a second officer's one, but oh, whatever. This probably would be an opportune moment to mention the binocular kerfuffle. As often told, Blair left with the key to the locker that held the binoculars for the lookouts. However, this drama goes with the idea that this was the only set of binoculars on the ship since, get this, there was no room for any more pairs on this 46,000 ton liner. If a second officer is allowed to complain, sir, the storage space is limited. I can't find the binoculars. Does anyone know where Davy put them? Except Mr. Lytell has lost the binoculars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not enough storage. <laughs> Aside from that, historically, there were usually plenty of binoculars for the officers, and they were seen using them regularly during the voyage. The whole binocular thing for the lookouts probably would not made much of a difference, since the method back then when looking for an object was to only use binoculars to confirm it once the naked eye had spotted it, the naked eye having a much wider field of vision, which is better when doing that sort of job. Since the berg was virtually on top of them when it was sighted, it is doubtful that it would have made much of a difference, although I will concede Fleet did claim the opposite. 
Since I brought this up in the Unite to Remember review, then I should mention it here again. The accents are a bit off. Whilst it is good to see Murdoch having a Scottish accent, we have Lightoller sounding like this. Second officer Charles Lightoller, at your service. Whereas the historical Lightoller was from Lancashire and spoke like this. Shall I get the women and children away, sir? He just nodded, so I started to fill the first boat. Moody was from Yorkshire, Thomas Andrews was from Ulster, and so on. Although I will admit in regards to the latter, I have read conflicting accounts as to his exact accent. The way people act in this drama series seems to be more informed by Julian Fellow's experiences writing Downton Abbey, rather than any serious research as to what life was like aboard a passenger liner in 1912. First off, dancing. In the first episode, we get scenes of people having a waltz in the hybrid lounge slash dining room. A bit more on that later. The thing is, this did not happen on the Titanic. She had no dedicated ballroom, and the White Star Line usually didn't have any sort of dancing in first class. We can be certain that, if for some reason all of the survivors got amnesia and forgot to mention dancing, Second Officer Lightoller would not be prancing around with actress Dorothy Gibson, since that is a major dereliction of duty. Even if he wasn't on watch, he would be around the officers' quarters, or off on other errands, not fraternising with the passengers as previously ranted about. Of course, since Fellows was used to the work of Downton, he just assumed it was like that at sea. Well, fair enough, I suppose. His response to being correct on this point by people who have actually done the research is interesting, though. In an interview for the Daily Telegraph, he said that, Having been irritated at these sorts of observations of Downton Abbey, I now find them rather a compliment. Good luck to these people. I like the fact they are watching and are checking every detail. There are whole departments dedicated to ensuring we get things right, and often these sorts of observations are incorrect. We certainly know that musicians on the Titanic played waltzes. I find it unlikely that there was no dancing. Well, good to see you came to that conclusion based on solid evidence and haven't just disregarded the research of many dedicated historians over the years. By the way, I would like to see which department was in charge of building this... thing. Now, when doing a Titanic drama, you have to make some allowances. It was a large ship, and unless you have the budget of James Cameron, you will never be able to fully recreate what the ship looked like. However, there are some famous areas that have become associated with the ship. The Grand Staircase, the smoker room where Thomas Andrews was allegedly last seen, and so on. Why on earth, then, did you merge all of those rooms and the library and smoking room into this? It doesn't even look like any room on the Titanic. I guess they were trying to go for the smoking room, but rather failed at doing it. I can't be too critical of the layout of the boat deck and so on, since I can at least see it is meant to be the Titanic. At least the corridors don't look too bad, with the exception of the dreaded Bostwick Gate. Now the Bostwick Gate, this lattice-style black iron gate here, is well known to anyone who has seen a Titanic film. It seems to crop up all the time, and if you believe these films, and even some hyperbolic documentaries, the ship had loads of these dotted around to keep third-class passengers down below. Now in reality, the gates dividing the classes were usually waist-high gates that could easily be climbed over if needed. The few Bostwick gates that were on the Titanic were usually left unlocked, or if they were locked, were near other passageways that were clear. What did stop a few people were some crew members stationed near the gates who did not know the ship was sinking, and tried to stop people climbing over gates and so forth. But this varied depending on the time and the location, with some third-class passengers reporting no obstructions, whilst others said the opposite. The reason why such a large number of third-class passengers were lost was due to a mixture of factors that included a breakdown in the command structure, with the officers being focused on lowering the boat and assuming the passengers had all been ordered up top, a lack of a proper evacuation plan, a language barrier, with up to half of the passengers in third class being non-English speakers, and general confusion about what to do and where to go, with the aforementioned crew members not understanding that the ship was sinking, and in a few cases preventing people from clambering over gates. The closest we get to a serious effort to block people from accessing the boats was towards the end, when the forward collapsibles were being lowered, and crew members had to prevent a rush on the last few boats. If you believe Julian Fellows, though, the officers and other members of the crew forcibly locked the third-class passengers down below, behind Bostwick gates that probably did not exist on this part of the ship, and even tried to murder the Italian waiters, as previously mentioned. I do wish this third-class passengers getting locked below myth would stop being perpetuated by Titanic dramas. Not only does it spread falsehoods, but in this case it is besmirching the legacy of real-life people like Moody, as previously discussed. Fellows complained about the 1997 version for being incorrect. I just wish Fellows had taken his own advice on this. Now, since Mr. Fellows wrote Downton and has complained about the errors of the 1997 movie, you would think then that he would all be too aware of the strict class divisions back in 1912 aboard ship, right? 
Well, in this one, we have the passengers from all three classes being allowed to attend the same church service. The second class Batleys having a jolly old cup of tea with the first class Mantons. And by the way, for some reason, Captain Smith is aware of the tea. Seriously, is he the captain of a liner or of a gossip magazine? And the second class maid being allowed to look for a locksmith in third class. Christ, at least Cameron tried to explain why Jack and Rose would meet and make sure it was only them that were breaking the class divide. I have a lot of criticism of Cameron's one as well, but you cannot claim it is inaccurate when you have all this going on. I would have thought that out of all the people, you, Julian, would have made a bit more of an effort to show proper class divisions. Overall, whilst I will say that I can at least tell it is meant to be set on the Titanic, the authenticity errors really did not help with this series. I think it was the least of the series' problems, mind you, and of course, some came about due to the limits of the budget and so forth, but there are many others that are here because of errors in the writing, and it gives me the impression that the makers of this series thought they were making a generic Edwardian era drama, as opposed to events that actually happened. Now, there are plenty of historical dramas that I have watched over the years that are questionable in terms of accuracy, but can be rather enjoyable as a drama on its own. I would say the 1953 Titanic film would fall into this category, a Titanic film that must rank as the most inaccurate ever made, but it was still a pretty solid drama in its own right. This 2012 miniseries, though, does not fall into that category. The worst part that really brings this drama down for me is the Groundhog Day structure for the first three episodes. I have already ranted about it in the first part in regards to how it affects the history, so sorry for sounding like a broken record, but I must bring it up again here. Now, having a non-linear story is something that can be done if pulled off well. My favourite anime, Princess Principle, does this with the first episode happening chronologically in the middle of the narrative, but it works well since it introduces the characters at the height of their story, and then in the following episodes, you go back and see how they got to that point. Not only that, but each episode is fairly self-contained, so other than episode 5 showing Chisei's introduction after we've already seen her in two episodes, it is not too jarring. Now, ironically enough, the episodes in this Titanic drama do technically follow a linear pattern, with the lead-up to the maiden voyage, the voyage itself, the iceberg and the evacuation, but then it goes back so you see the same story several times over. If it were adding something, or creating suspense, then I could perhaps understand. Prepri handles this much better. For example, the end of episode 2 hints that Arnold and Charlotte have some sort of hidden past, which is then further expanded upon several episodes later. Titanic tries this, but it just falls flat, since we have no clue as to what the hell is going on. For example, Mabel Watson, the maid to Lord and Lady Muck, is shown in one episode asking for a locksmith in third class, as part of a convoluted plot to frame someone for breaking into a jewellery case, so they get the blame for stealing a brooch that she has actually hidden away. The thing is, though, there really is no suspense to it, and no payoff. Prepri's suspense is that these two characters have already swapped their roles of Princess and Pauper before the story even begins, and then we are left wondering, wait, how did they do that? I want to see more. Then we get that payoff when we find out that they were childhood friends, and in the chaos of a revolution, were accidentally switched. Here, I have no reason to watch Head since it is a broken lock on a jewellery case. And the payoff is non-existent, since the reasons for her stealing the brooch is her trying to cover her dad's medical bills. Right up until the moment she confesses all this to her butler friend, we have had no indication whatsoever that she even had a living father, let alone one requiring medical care. Not to mention the whole harebrained scheme is just silly. Yes, I will admit people do irrational things, but why go to all that length with trying to frame some random third-class passenger? Just say it got packed in the wrong case or something like that. You could have at least introduced some sort of element of her father's story, maybe a letter or something, not just leave it as a complete surprise. And due to the Groundhog Day mechanic, we get all of these jumbled up scenes so by the time the next episode comes around, when we do get the info, we have forgotten all about them and the characters. This happens as well for Lord Muck and his illegitimate daughter, who we never see and get two mentions of as a payoff for all the angst between the Batleys and the Mansons. Christ Julian, you're being beaten by steampunk anime girls at this point. The spontaneous love and romance in this makes the animated version look like a well thought out and perfectly planned film by comparison. At least Will and Discount Anastasia in that one had some scenes together before falling in love. Seriously though, Mary and Bob Ross act all antagonistic in the first two scenes they are in together. Then they go to a church service and then they have a scene up on deck and suddenly they are passionately in love with one another. 
May I remind you that you have been married to your husband for several years and have a load of children. Yes, there are people who have been happily married with children who suddenly run off, but they will at least spend some time with the person they're going to run off with. Her story as well gets absolutely no payoff, since we are left to assume that her lover dies on the Titanic, and we know for a fact that her husband and eldest daughter go down with it. Do we see her react to the aftermath? Do we get a scene on the Carpathia where she has to come to terms with the loss of her loved ones while still caring for her remaining children? No, because the damned episode ends with the Carpathia arriving. We don't even get to see her in the lifeboat, save for one last shot of her sailing away before the ship even sinks. Even generic maid number 24 gets a scene to reflect on the loss of Paolo, and I think she has less screen time and backstory than the third class family. I think my main problem with how it works as a story is that they approach it from all the wrong angle. In various interviews made before the release of the series, Fellows and Stafford Clark talk about how they wanted to do something different, and decided to make a drama looking at the period rather than the ship itself, merely using the Titanic as a background to things like the Irish Home Rule Act, the Siege of City Street, and even mention of the upcoming First World War. This was a critical error, since they've already bed shows like Downton Abbey, Upstairs Downstairs and others that feature made-up characters interacting with real events. You have a bit more flexibility with those dramas, since you are on land in a made-up stately home somewhere. Here, you are on a very real ship, with very real, living, breathing people that did very real things, and they decided to ignore that in favour of presenting us with generic plot lines about events happening elsewhere at the time. The reason why people are interested in dramas about the Titanic is that the story of the ship and its people is interesting in its own right. We have the pride of the White Star Line, largest and safest ship afloat, sailing into an ice field with a mixture of controversial decisions in the short and long term that all add up to create a tragedy. Then, during the evacuation, we see these famous people and how they face death. We have some like the Duff Gordons and Bruce Ismay who became cast as villains afterwards, others like Murdoch and Moody who effectively became heroes, and some stories like that of the Goodwin family who became victims of this whole affair. We don't watch Titanic dramas to watch another version of Downton Abbey. We watch it because it is the Titanic. Overall then, this has to rank as one of the worst Titanic dramas ever made. Whilst it could be argued that ones like the 1996 miniseries are worse, and let us be fair, nothing will ever compare to the animated version, this one has to be one of the most jarring to me, due to its terrible decisions to make each episode like Groundhog Day, focus on bland and generic Downton Abbey characters, and gloss over or even outright lie about the lives and reputations of historical people who were on the Titanic. This is a real shame, since the 100th anniversary was a golden opportunity to do a good, honest drama about the series for a new generation, but instead we got this. And despite it being touted as THE event of 2012, it has now been generally forgotten by most. Hopefully we might get a good drama at some point, in the style of the old A Night to Remember classic, which looks at actual stories and doesn't just flat out lie and make up stuff. But sadly, I fear we might be waiting for some time for that. In the meantime, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.